Hi, and welcome to Cooking Classic. I'm Kathy Coslett, and we're here at the Kowalski Auditorium and Media Center at the Culinary Institute at Luzerne County Community College, and we have a brand new show for you. We are going to spotlight some of the talents of our area's best chefs. Here to kick off tonight's show is certified executive chef Dave Pembleton. Hello. Hi, Dave. How are you? Glad to see you tonight. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've uh, been a a uh, teacher here for about uh, 17 years. Prior, prior before coming here, I was a chef at a, uh, the Carriage Stop Inn and, and the Mount Laurel Resort okay. in the Poconos. And uh, I've been here as, a, as an instructor for the last 17 years, like I said. And uh, I've attended, uh, Indi I started here as my associate's degree here. I moved on to Indiana University of Pennsylvania and on um, to Bloomsburg University for a master's degree in education. Terrific. And I have to tell you, we're in really good hands tonight because Dave is not only a certified executive chef, but he's also a certified culinary educator. So that means he's here to teach us a real lot. Tell us what that means. What makes a certified executive chef different than a regular executive chef? Well, through the American Culinary Federation of America, which is the largest organization for uh, professional chefs, you go through a battery of tests to test uh, your, your, your knowledge in the field. And then you have to take uh, some practical cooking tests to um, make sure that you can cook. And, uh, <laughs> that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you can cook to a certain <laughs> level, they uh, award you a certification. And uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I've been a, uh, a certified executive chef for about 15 years and a certified culinary educator for about 10. Okay, so the certified culinary educator means you get to take all of these things that you learn and pass them on to aspiring chefs? Right, and teach the students, help them achieve okay. their goals in, in, in you know, whatever they want to do. Okay, and so now tonight you're going to teach all of us people that think we're chefs. So tell us what you're going to be preparing. Well, we're going to work on a, a, a cooking method called sautéing tonight, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be uh, doing two different dishes today. The first dish being a chicken scampi, because I think everybody kind of understands what that is. And after I show you how easy it is, uh, some of you will probably make it at home. <laughs> uh, second dish is a pork hunter style, which is a little bit more uh, detailed, uh, has a few more ingredients. But using the same method, which I think you'll find is uh, fairly easy. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Sounds delicious. Sounds great. We're going to go to a break. We'll be right back. And when we return, we're going to be in the kitchen, get this guy working and see what he has for us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and for those of you who are just joining us, we are with Certified Executive Chef Dave Pembleton, and he is going to talk with us tonight about sautéing. His first dish is chicken scampi. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Well, we start with a, with a pan on top of the stove. It's very important to first get the pan pretty hot, because I think that I, as, a, as an instructor, I think probably the most important thing about sautéing is achieving caramelization of the meat, okay? So I'm gonna put a little bit of oil in there, just enough to cover the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna make sure that, the, that it's hot enough, okay? And the way I see if it's, if it's hot enough, I put a little bit of flour in there. Okay. As you can see right away, the, the, the flour that I put there starts to sizzle, and I think that's pretty important. I'm using chicken tenderloins, uh, because I think that they're really tender, mm -hmm. they pound out nice, and they're, they're rather uh, uniform in size. Uh, so they all cook, kind of uni uniformly. 
Now you're just dredging them lightly. Just correct? very That's lightly. And I'm, I'm, isn't it? Yeah, I'm yeah. shaking it off as well okay. uh, because if you don't, they, they can tend to get a pasty taste to them. Okay. And now, let me ask you about the vein that's in that chicken tenderloin. Must it come out? I know I always cut it out, but other people say, oh, you really don't have to do that. Could be a real problem, okay? Nice. What I tend to do is I tend to try to buy smaller chicken tenderloins. I don't know if you've ever seen the chicken breasts that are in the market now, but it looks like to me they came from Three Mile Island, okay? They're so <laughs> big, okay? And the tenderloins from those are very, very big, and that vein that you're talking about runs all the way through it, and it's mm -hmm. very tough. Okay. So I tend to use the smaller ones, and if you use the smaller ones, uh, you just have to take the tip off of them, okay? And by taking the tip off, the little bit that runs down through it will cook out. So you won't taste that, you know, like being like dental floss between your teeth, okay? That kind of thing. All right, okay? so you really don't have to cut through the whole tenderloin. Then. I do not. If, if you get off. smaller tenderloins, you don't have to do that. All, right, all you terrific. have to do is take the tip off. I'm going to okay? remember that. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait a, a, a few minutes until it caramelizes. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. parts of cooking you can't rush. Okay? And okay. this is one of those things that you just can't rush it. Okay? So I'm waiting for, and uh, relatively high heat. You see that brownness, yeah. that caramelization? I tell my students, you have to make that because you can't buy it in a can. Because yeah. if I could buy that flavor in a can, I would. I wouldn't have to go through the work. It looks it's, really nice. It's really, really it important. It smells very good, too. One thing I noticed, you didn't put any salt and pepper on those? I didn't. I'm going to make a really flavorful sauce, so I okay. did not. I did not uh, salt and pepper this uh, chicken. What happens if you put salt on the meat? What happens sometimes? It makes uh, moisture come to the top of the surface of the meat, and then it doesn't caramelize as well. Uh, so that's why that's I don't do that. Okay. So I'll, I'll flavor. I'll, I'll make a very flavorful sauce, uh, but I, I generally don't salt and pepper the meat. Okay. Now that we've achieved that caramelization, here's the second most important thing that I could teach you about sauteing, okay? A lot of people don't do this. You, take, you have to take the meat out of the pan. The reason being, if I try to make the sauce in the pan with, with that protein, that meat protein, what's gonna happen is gonna create steam and steam's gonna toughen the meat. So it's very, very important to do that, okay? So next, we're gonna, put, we're gonna start to make a sauce. So we're gonna put some butter. How much butter? Julia Child says, never enough, okay? <laughs> Uh, if you're, if you're uh, heart conscious, health conscious, you can put a little bit less, okay? Garlic, we're gonna put some garlic. If you're gonna make scampi, you have to have garlic. How much garlic? As much as you can stand, okay? Now, garlic is one of those foods that is supposed to be absolutely wonderful for you too, right. isn't it? It's, it's really, so. really good for you. It's, you know, it's, uh, I can't live without it. I'd yeah, put it in I my Cheerios if my wife would let me, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure she would. Okay, so now we've got our garlic, and you notice I didn't put it back on the heat yet. I've uh, caramelized my garlic a little bit. Now I'm gonna put in a little bit of flour. I'm gonna, I'm, this is a cooking term called roux. We're gonna equal parts of fat and flour. Now I'm gonna put it back onto the heat. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a little bit of parsley for color and a little bit of flavor. Now, we're gonna put up our heat back up to high because we're gonna do a cooking term now called deglazing. And sometimes you have to watch, if you're using a high, high uh, liquor content alcohol, you have to be careful, because sometimes it has a tendency to flame up. We got a little bit of flame here. And we're gonna wait till the, you know, the alcohol mm -hmm. cooks out. Now we're gonna put our broth, our chicken broth. However much you need. And then I, I like to use a wooden spoon. A lot of people would use these tongs, but I feel if you, if you use these tongs to scrape the bottom of that pan, you do two things. You make the sauce kind of gray, and you put a metallic taste to the food. Okay? See, I, really, I, I never really believed that, but now that you told it's me. It's very true. I, I believe it. Especially okay. if you're using aluminum cookware, okay. because aluminum cookware, uh, that, that color happens uh, now, is More that often true with other steel. sauces, even spaghetti sauces, red sauces, those types of things, or not so much? Uh, well, if I'm making spaghetti sauce because it's a, a thick sauce, I always use a wooden paddle. Okay. Because if you scrape with the bottom the, with the metal, it scrapes right. the tomato sauce off the bottom, and it gives it a burnt taste all the way through. Okay. So I'm, I'm a proponent of wooden spoons. Uh, my mother used to use wooden spoons for something else. <laughs> I use them for cooking. Okay? <laughs> so... And what we do now is now we have a high heat. So, you know, controlling the temperature of the pan is pretty important. And when, I, when that sauce gets thick enough, then I'm going to put the, I'm going to reintroduce the chicken back to the pan. And because it's so thin, it cooks quickly, it'll only take just a few minutes to finish off in the pan. 
And then I'm going to finish it off with more butter. Right? Uh, now, if it gets too thick, can we just add some more chicken broth? And, That's why and I, I okay. held a little bit oh, of broth see, back. He's smart, right? isn't he? Mm. And, and in the food service industry, you always have these things at your disposal. You always have a chicken broth or a vegetable broth, so you can do that. And if it gets too thick, if it's too thin, you let it reduce. If it gets too thick, you put a little bit more broth. So This might sound a little crazy, too, but is it, would it be good for all of us at home to really do what you've done here and get all of your ingredients out, measured, and ready to go? Well, that... I, think, I think if you want to have dinner on the table quickly, I think uh -huh. this is the perfect cooking method. And you can have all this stuff done mm -hmm. the day before. Okay. So, I mean, I think I could easily put this dish together in 10 minutes at home. Okay. So you get a, you get a restaurant-quality meal using grocery store ingredients in 10 minutes. So it's, uh, I like this cooking method a lot. I squeeze a little lemon there. I like the acidity along to go along with the fat of the butter. I think it, uh, it gives it a really nice flavor. Plus I like the smell of lemon. Yeah. Now what we're gonna do is, I, you notice I've turned the heat back down now. Mm -hmm. The reason I've turned the heat back down is now that the sauce is about thick enough, I'm gonna put it back in here. And if, if I left that a, a rapid boil like it was, what would happen is it would toughen the proteins of the chicken, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put them back in the, in the sauce here, and we're just gonna let them simmer just for a second, you know, just for a minute or two. And I'm gonna use a little bit more parsley for color. And this, this would probably be best served over a rice pilaf or a nice pasta, depending on what, you, what you're gonna use it for. Uh, if you're going to put it over a pasta, maybe use a little bit more broth to make a little bit more sauce and those types of things, okay? So other than, you know, other than that, this dish is pretty much done. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring the plate over and I'm going to plate this up okay. and I'm going to finish. Can I help you? Would you like me to hold that? No. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put it right okay. on the stove here, just like so. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I always uh, tell our students to, you want food served hot, you start with a hot plate, okay? okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to plate this dish. And I always tell the students too that the rim of the plate, I don't know if you've watched these other food shows where they're putting all kinds of seasonings and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff on mm -hmm. the edge of the plate. Well, here at, here at, the, at, at our, our cooking institute, um, when I teach anyway, I really don't like anything on the rim of the plate. I attribute that like the, like the frame of a painting. Okay. okay. Now we're ready to finish it with butter, and this gives it a richness right at the end, and it gives it a shine, which I really like. How many students do you have here at the Institute? Well, I think that we have about 120 culinary students, mm -hmm. about uh, 50 baking students, and somewhere in the vicinity of about 70 hotel and restaurant management students. So, That's incredible. That's fabulous. And I think that uh, business has increased since we've gotten mm -hmm. a new building mm -hmm. and that type of thing. So I think, uh, I think our, you know, we're, our numbers are very, very good. Okay. And then you would just nappe the sauce over the top. Oh, that looks wonderful. Just like so. And then I usually use a little bit of a garnish today. I have a lemon twist. So we're going to put a lemon twist on the top. Now, do you do that at home? Of course. <laughs> I do all the cooking at home. I don't know how to do <laughs> well, anything <that's> else. That's good. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. So, and that's kind of how the dish would look. Delicious. When we return, Chef Dave is going to be cooking up pork hunter style. We'll be right back. Make your life better by degrees. Choose from over 100 academic and career programs. Go to an accredited college at the area's lowest tuition. Earn your degree or transfer your credits to a four-year college or university. Take your life to the next level. Achieve your career goals and reach your fullest potential at Luzerne County Community College.
Welcome back. I'm with certified executive chef Dave Pembleton, and we are going to be cooking. You notice how I said we, by the way, uh, pork <laughs> hunter style. <laughs> okay, same, uh, same method of cooking, saute. So we're going to start with just a little bit of oil. And I think we said that so it doesn't make a greasy sauce. Right. Um, again, I'm going to check it with a little bit of flour. If that flour kind of sizzles up right away, I think we're ready. So I think that if looks pretty good. someone really wanted to measure a little bit of oil, what, do you, what would you say? I would say a tablespoon. Okay. Depending on the like size nothing. of the pan. It's, it's, it's virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you put too much, it makes, the, it makes the sauce, because we're making a sauce in the pan, it makes it really greasy. So, and the flour is to help it not stick to the pan. Mm -hmm. It's to help, help it brown nicely. Mm -hmm. Now, is this meat seasoned at all prior to the flour? Uh, just a little bit of pepper. Okay, I thought I saw pepper on yeah, there. A little bit I of was pepper. waiting to see what you uh, I think salt uh, has a tendency to bring the moisture to the top of the meat, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't caramelize as well. Okay. And this time we have a lot more ingredients to go in the pan. It's a little bit more complex dish. Uh, the wines change. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to use uh, a red wine or, or a Marsala wine uh, for this dish, either, or, either one that you have, and uh, a beef broth. So. Some of the ingredients change, the method does not. Does a marsala or a red wine really change the flavor that much? I think it does. It, it does? It, it sweetens it up. Okay. okay. It sweetens it up a little bit. So, And um, I generally like to cook with wines that I would drink. So we're just waiting for this to brown mm -hmm. up a little bit. Again, we're going to make the heat a little higher, get that caramelization going on. What's a serving per person, too? Well, I think five, six ounces of meat for dinner is probably about right, especially with sautéing because we put a lot of stuff in that dish. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're going to put some mushrooms and onions and shallots. We're going to finish it up with some fresh vegetables. And as you can see, I'm going to take, just like the last time, I'm going to take the meat out of the pan. You notice there's a little bit of brownness at the bottom of the pan. That's called a fond, and that's going to create a great flavor uh, for us uh, when we're making our sauce. Okay. So again, I didn't even put the, the heat back on yet. I'm going to put my butter in my pan, and I'm going to start to create my sauce. Again, if, you, uh, if you're more health conscious, you can cut down a little bit on the butter. Now, the flavoring ingredients I'm using here for this dish are minced shallots, which is kind of like a cross between an onion and a garlic. That's a very sweet flavor that I think goes very well with red meats and pork and veal. And I have a little bit of quartered onion. Um, a hunter style dish is more of a chunky um, farmer type sauce. So uh, I, like, I like to let the vegetables and stuff kind of mm -hmm. dig. The reason I mince the shallots because shallots can tend to have a stronger flavor. So uh, I mince them so they're not too powerful. Now we're gonna turn the, we're gonna turn the heat back on. Also we're gonna use some mushrooms, okay? I've quartered the mushrooms. Again, I wanna, I wanna try to keep them a little bit, uh, little bit on the chunky side. Does it matter what type of mushroom you use? I don't think it really, really? does. Whatever your favorite kind is. Uh, I like these Pennsylvania mushrooms, and uh, I, didn't, you know, I didn't know if you knew that Kennett Square in Pennsylvania was the mushroom capital of the world. We oh. produce more mushrooms than anybody in the world. So these are just white Pennsylvania mushrooms. You can use shiitake mm -hmm. mushrooms, but you'd have to pull the stem out first. You could use oyster mushrooms. At this point in time, we're going to start to uh, uh, put some thickening agent in there. We're, again, we're going to make a roux in the bottom of the pan. So just the ingredients change. The method of cooking doesn't change at all. All right, and for those just tuning in, the wooden spoon deal is really important. I think it is. Yeah, it helps us, it helps us get that fond off mm -hmm. the bottom of the pan because that's where all the flavor is. Without leaving a metallic flavor. Exactly, taste. yes. So that and wasn't an old wives tale. Right. Now we're going to put our wine in, and this one might tend to flare up a little more. <laughs> right. Now we're going to... Scrape that fond from the bottom. This is actually really beautiful. This yeah. Is good looking. Yeah, it's nice, mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> nice. So you, as much as you, that stuff you can scrape off the bottom, mm -hmm. as much flavor as you're going to create. And we're going to take it off the pan. We're going to add our... And you notice when I put the wine in, I didn't throw the wine right in the pan on the stove. I've uh, seen that come back on people and burn people. So yeah. I always teach the students uh, to, to make sure they take it off when they're putting the wine before they deglaze the pan. Okay? Now we're gonna, again, we're gonna put a, up a high heat and we're just gonna wait till this we, would reduce. And by reducing what happens to the flavor of the sauce, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. And the thickness, you know, the, the sauce gets a little bit thicker. 
uh, so it coats it, it, it holds to the to, to the food better and you can use uh, you can use uh, beef with this you can use pork mm -hmm. um, you could use lamb if you wanted to. Oh, that's interesting. You know, so depending on what culture you're from and what type of meat you like mm -hmm. to eat, you could do it with chicken as well. Now, will this sauce get as thick? Do you want this as thick as you did the scampi sauce? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it's, that, that's, that was about the right consistency. Okay. okay? Um, the scampi, if I were going to put it over pasta, I would mm -hmm. probably have it a little bit thinner. Okay. So it would coat to the noodles without, like, coming to a congealed-like mm -hmm. mess. Like uh, if you go out to some restaurants, you, I think you know what I'm talking about. So what would you serve this with? I might so serve this with nice roasted red potatoes oh, that sounds great. and a fresh steamed okay. vegetable. Or maybe I would serve it with wild rice. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I would serve it with couscous. So uh, all those types of things. And I think the saute red potatoes method. potatoes have my vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the saute method is, is more of an upscale cooking method. So I, I think it goes best with mm -hmm. like fresh vegetables, like steamed vegetables like asparagus, broccoli. Okay those types of things. Now, like you see, you know, I, I, I t I'm taking a while before I put that meat back in the pan because if I put it in premature, prematurely, it, it'll toughen up the meat. But I think that we're almost there. And again, I'm going to finish this sauce with a little bit of butter. Tell us again why that last pat of butter. It gives it a shine. Okay. It gives it richness, mm -hmm. it adds flavor, and um, all those things are good, I think. And this sauce is just about thick enough, so I'm, again, I'm going to turn my heat down so I don't toughen up the meat. And uh, you might think that it's not that big of a deal, but it's, it's a major deal. So we're going to put these back into the, into the sauce here just to let the flavors of the sauce come into the meat and, and vice versa like so. So now we're going to get ready to plate this one up as well, like so. So we're going to take the meat out of the pan, like so. Nothing along the rim. I try not to, yeah. <laughs> and if I get anything on the rim, I try to wipe it off, like so, okay. I like to put it nicely. Mm -hmm. and we're going to oh, turn, you turn it up. Turn the heat back up now because I want to reduce it just a little bit more. Now we're going to put our our flavorings. So I've got right. some fresh chopped rosemary, which is just oh, a beautiful flavor. Great. I've got some cherry tomatoes and some scallions. And this is just more of a garnish. I really don't want to cook this too much. Okay. You know, I'm going to toss these around a little bit. It's a nice da dish to make around the, the holidays yeah, for those pretty. colors, those, that green and red color there. I think you have to come back and teach us how to do this. This is, this is incredible. Okay. It really is. All right. We'll put that there like so. All right. Well, thank you very much, okay. and thank all of you for joining us, and we hope you'll tune in again for Cooking Classic.